Hello everyone, this is Dino Chris from Prehistoric Facts, and this is a Q&A episode, so let's actually get started, shall we? So, Luke Zello, I got some questions for me. Uh, could Caprosuka survive modern-day Africa? And so, <clears throat> and so uh, for many of you that don't know, Caprosuchus is a type of uh, ancient crocodile. It'd be considered a medium-sized crocodile. Uh, a crocodile that would probably get around, say, between 10, around 10 to 18 feet. And, um, and it's actually a croc that actually has like these almost like tusk-like teeth uh, a little bit. Uh, and that's why it was given the name Boar Croc. <clears throat> because it has all those those like teeth that actually look like uh, boar tusks. But um, could it survive in today's Africa? Uh, I would probably say maybe. Uh, I would say that it would be competing against uh, the Nile crocodile most of the time. But I think it's be the one animal I think it would probably have to stay away from mostly is uh, hippos. Hippos are, are a danger to most uh, Nile crocodiles. But even though that they coexist around each other, not too bad. Um, but even though that like uh, hippos uh, will attack Nile crocodiles uh, when uh, the occasion calls for it, mainly due to, like, either in, like, uh, territory disputes or otherwise, um, like, say, if, uh, a female hippo saw, uh, like, one of its, like, uh, young, uh, being attacked by a croc, uh, the, the mother would actually be able to, like, go after the croc and probably do some nasty damage to that croc. And so, yeah, but I would say Caprosuchus probably has a small chance of survival in Africa, but... I wouldn't rule out the possibility that it could. But at least it's a good question. Uh, your next one. Who would win? Danodon or Ceratosaurus? So you got a Entelodont versus a Theropod Dinosaur from the Jurassic. And so um, in the Danodon, uh, the Entelodont, uh, that animal lived around the Oligocene to around the Oligocene and Pliocene uh, at or actually Miocene Epoch, excuse me. So it's the Oligocene and the Miocene Epoch uh, in the Age of Mammals. Uh, but then you actually have uh, Ceratosaurus, which actually lived around 170 to 145 million years ago. And so the so a, di a theropod dinosaur versus a, a mammal. And this and Deodon is one of the largest uh, entelodonts uh, known in the fossil record. So... I would have to go with Deodon on this one because of the fact is that Deodon has the bone, bone crushing jaws, and also it's a bit a little bit more a little bit smarter than Ceratosaurus because it's got that mammalian brain, and uh, and even though that Ceratosaurus could do some damage against Deodon, I just don't see uh, uh, Ceratosaurus doing too much against uh, Deodon. And uh, Ceratosaurus is not built for combat that much. It's not really built for combat. It's mainly designed to like get a bite and then get away. Otherwise, it's more likely going to go after small prey. And just to, just to be clear too, these animals never met each other. Like you know, just so you know. But uh, I would have to go with Deodon on that one. Uh, your next question is. Uh, were dinosaurs like, for example, Dakota Raptor able to jump? I would say the raptorial dinosaurs, yes, they were able to jump. Um, in terms of, like, say, other theropod dinosaurs, uh, like, say, the large ones, they probably didn't jump that much. Uh, I would probably say that that the raptorial dinosaurs were able to jump because they had the leg power and the and those. Uh, that agility to be able to do it. I think troodontids were able to do it. Um, Ornithomimids could possibly do it, but I probably would say they didn't do it that much. Um, but it's mainly the raptorial dinosaurs. I think the raptorial dinosaurs were able to do it, um, but not the large theropod dinosaurs. And then your next question... Uh, who would win, Postosuchus or Megalania? So you have a Triassic archosaur uh, against a monitor lizard that lived in the Pleistocene. Uh, so these two animals have one thing adva one advantage in mind, and that is armor. They have armor, and so 
Postosuchus uh, has armor along its back, so mainly like bony scutes uh, on its back, whereas Megalania has bone embedded in the skin. And when you look at monitor lizards, uh, when you look inside their skin, they have little itty bitty bits of bone uh, in their skin. And so that makes them really, really tough. They're really tough, hardy animals, and they're able to actually take withstand some damage. Um, I would say Postosuchus has agility on its side. It has speed and agility on its side, whereas Megalania, uh, it has the better armor, and also it has uh, the better bite, because monitor lizards, they have a venom gland on the bottom on their bottom jaw. And so they actually have a venom gland in the bottom jaw, and then actually, and that venom is to uh, is like an anti anti clotting um, uh, venom. So it actually prevents the blood from clotting. So this animal, so animal, so its prey would basically just bleed. It would just bleed uh, after envenomation. You just bleed to death. Uh, whereas, whereas Postosuchus does not have that advantage. It does not have that advantage. So I would probably have to go with Megalania on this one. Megalania is also a tad bit longer than Postosuchus, and also the Megalania has a better, has a little bit better flexibility uh, in terms of, like, say, say, its tail and also its back. Whereas Postosuchus, I wouldn't say it's rigid. I would say it's still flexible in its own way, but not really designed uh, to actually. Uh, be able to make the nicer, quicker, quick turns. You see, Megalania has the advantage of being on four limbs, so it can turn a little bit better than, say, Postosuchus can. But even though Postosuchus could do some pretty nasty damage to Megalania, but I'm going to have to give it to Megalania because of the venom. Because of the venom. The venom will definitely be the advantage for um, Megalania. And then now we go to Luke, uh, to Nicol Nicholas, excuse me, Nicholas. Uh, what is the top speed of Dinochirus compared to Ornithomy Ornithomimosaurs, like Ganolimus, Struthiomimus, and Ornithomimus itself? Uh, not very fast. Dinochirus is not built for speed. It is not built for speed. It's too big uh, to be designed for speed. And also, like, this animal is mainly designed just to basically kind of walk around the terrain a little bit more and it kind of lived a tad bit more of swampy environment so it didn't need to actually be uh very fast so top speed of dinochirus like if it was able to run i would probably say it was pretty like just around five to six miles per hour not very fast uh whereas like the one of the other one of the mimus like gallimimus struthiomimus and ornithomimus those dinosaurs have top speeds of 35 uh, mile per hour plus. And so, like, Ornithomimus would have, like, Ornithomimus and Struthiomimus would be very, very close to each other in terms of top speed, because those dinosaurs could actually reach close to 50 miles per hour. You know, Gallimimus would actually be more towards 40. And so, yeah, I would probably definitely say that Dinocarmus is not very fast at all. Not very fast at all. Uh, could the size of Dinochirus be larger than 36 feet long, like up to 40 feet long, like when it was first discovered? Uh, it's a possibility. I think it's definitely a possibility that it could reach 40 feet. Uh, but that is... Uh, a, it's, it's a rough estimate. It's a very good rough, rough estimate of possibly a top size, like a full gro fully grown one. Like, say, like if it's a really large Dinochirus... Like, 40 feet does seem plausible. 36 feet right now is the average right now. It's pretty much the average uh, adult length because there's only been a few um, adults that have been found. And so 36 feet, that is pretty average right now. 40 feet is still a possibility, but I would definitely say that that right now it's it's just mainly to that extent right there. It's just an, an average uh, size. Is 36. Uh, what do you think of the skin color of the T-Rex from Walking with Dinosaurs in the Valley of T-Rex and other documentaries? Ooh, this is a good one. Uh, what do I think of the color scheme of many of the T-Rexes in some documentaries? Oh, that's a... I would probably have to say 
Um, walking with dinosaurs is not bad. It's not bad. Uh, I do like the throw color that it do like the the like pink and or orangish like uh, pouch of skin like underneath the like on the underside of the neck. I do like that part. I do, th and I do like the kind of like uh, pattern on the tail of the walking with dinosaurs uh, T Rex. Uh, the uh, Valley of T Rex one. Uh, I know they gave it many types of color schemes. Like they gave one that is very similar to, like, say, a turkey vulture. Uh, they also gave one that was more like, say, like kind of almost like a tiger uh, type of uh, color scheme. Um, even though that the when dinosaurs roamed America, T Rex that had more almost like tiger stripes uh, on it. Uh, even though like um, uh, Jurassic Fight Club gave T Rex a like a tiger striped. Uh, type of uh, look to it, but do I think that's the best pattern for T Rex? Absolutely not. I would because like even though that like yes, it is definitely a possibility that it could have tiger stripe, uh, kind of almost like tiger stripes, but not really. Um, I would I would say that like the when dinosaurs roamed America, uh, T Rex colors were actually were actually what I I did like those. Um. I would have to say Valley of the T-Rex, they gave it different kinds of colors. Um, the turkey vulture type of color scheme, like, is it plausible? Maybe, but I'd say the full-on red uh, head is not really going to happen. It's not really going to happen. I would probably say that, like, it's too bright of a color uh, to actually, uh, like, be able to actually hide from herbivore to hide from your prey. Like the black part of your body can actually be very useful uh, to hide. So I would definitely say that like my favorite ones is probably planet or prehistoric planet. And uh, when dinosaurs from America, T-Rexes, I think those color schemes actually worked really, really nicely. One with dinosaurs is okay. Um, Valley of the T-Rex, I would probably say that's it's meh at best. Um, like, I thought, like, the Dinosaur Revolution T-Rexes, I thought those looked really cool, especially the males, like, when they had the really white head um, uh, type of look to it. I thought those were really cool, but even though that's just mainly just to show the audience of how cool, just to show the coolness of that one. But, um, yeah, I liked uh, When Dinosaurs Run to America, color scheme and prehistoric planet those were the ones that i liked a little bit better um uh, even though that i do like i did like the color scheme in um life on our planet on t-rexes those were actually really and really nicely done did like those uh has it been confirmed that young t-rexes have longer arms than adults because i have some doubts that young t-rex arms are long than adult longer than adults and there are no complete fossils of young t-rexes and with the nano tyrannus debate still going yet yeah, this is actually something that's still uh debated is whether did the young t-rexes have really long arms compared to the adults now there is that specimen from the dueling dinosaurs you know where it's a, a young tyrannosaur uh up against a young uh, Ceratopsian, and that's at the North Carolina State uh, Museum. Uh, and so that, or the Museum of Natural History, and that that showcases that youngster had long arms. But the thing is, they're saying this is a youngster. This is not an adult. And so could the young T-Rexes have long arms? Maybe. It's still unconfirmed, though. It is still unconfirmed. Because right now, how most like paleo artists and documentaries have been portraying young T Rexes is that they still have the they still have uh, small arms. But even though they're not like puny arms, like say they're kind of very similar to the adults, I think they did have arms that were actually long enough to be able to cap to actually be able to hold on to prey. It's just that as they got much larger, when they start reaching their teenage years, that's when a lot of the focus of the growth actually goes towards the skull. The skull. And also the neck region 
and just building up that weight to actually be become an adult. And I just think that the youngsters still have long enough arms to be able to capture the prey, uh, to basically hold on to it while the mouth did the dirty work. But then as they got older, uh, that's when the the skull became more, the, the jaws and teeth were more prioritized to actually uh, capture their prey. And so, yeah, I definitely say that that it's still a possibility, but it's still debatable. It's still debatable. But good question, though. All right, Alex, what is your number one favorite Ceratopsian? Oh, that's a good one. Um, I mean, I love all Ceratopsians, but which one do I like more? Like, I mean, Triceratops is still an icon. I mean, like, there's no doubt about it that Triceratops is an icon, but it's not my all-time favorite in terms of Ceratopsians. Um, I'm going to have to say Styracosaurus. I just have a love for that dinosaur, just the, just how unique it is compared to other Ceratopsians. You know, the horns on the frill, that nose horn, and, like, it's just so unique. It's just so unique. I love Styracosaurus. Styracosaurus is, like, just such a cool dinosaur. When I was a kid, when I actually uh, first saw an image of Styracosaurus, I was just like, wow, what an amazing-looking dinosaur. Like, the horns on the frill, the that nose horn, like, it's just like, wow, that's such an amazing dinosaur. I'm going to have to go with Styracosaurus. But, I mean, let me know what your favorite Ceratopsian is out there. Let me know in the comments down below. What's your favorite Ceratopsian? Like, I know there's many of you that are going to say Triceratops, but, like, uh, but let's just uh, show, showcase what your favorite Ceratopsian is, because, like, I would definitely say Styracosaurus. All right, that's all the questions I got for you today. Uh, this coming Thursday will be a special episode. I'll let you guys know what prehistoric I'm going to talk about, so stay tuned for that. But you can still send me questions about dinosaurs and other prehistoric life by email, emailing me at dinocrest71 at gmail.com. Let's go to my Facebook page, Prehistoric Facts with DinoCrest. Like the page, you should post your questions in the comment section. Please put them in the comment section. Don't put them on Messenger. Messenger is a private conversation, so please put your questions in the comment section on any Facebook post. And also for you YouTubers out there, feel free to like the video, subscribe to the channel according to my analytics. So I'll a lot of you guys are checking out my channel and not subscribed yet, so please feel free to hit that subscribe button and also hit the like button because that's how the YouTube algorithm works. The more likely the, the more likes the video gets, the more likely it gets spread out to people that are interested in dinosaurs, prehistoric life, paleontology, and geology in general. So please feel free to do so and also share the video, share the channel to anybody that is interested in dinosaurs, prehistoric life, paleontology, and geology in general. So please feel free to do so and also hit that notification bell so that way you can get get weekly notifications of every video that comes out. And also for you YouTubers out there, feel free to leave your videos in the comment section because I do leave your questions in the comment section. I, I do appreciate that uh, for these Q&A episodes. So all of you that are sending me questions via uh, email, Facebook, and YouTube, you guys are awesome. You're giving me some great questions for these Q&A episodes. And so keep up the great work. And also make sure you keep your questions short to the point. You can also follow me on Instagram at dino.chris.pf. That's some pretty cool stuff on there. And so it's di at dinochris.pf. So that's my Instagram, and it's the same thing on threads. You can follow me on threads at dino.chris.pf. I post pretty cool stuff on there as well. Also, take care of people around here. Notice if you're younger people out there, it makes you listen to your parents, your teachers, and your guardians. It's the best motivation you can have for a good education. It's very important to have, to have a good education. with a good education. Get a good job in the future. And I know the school year has already begun for many of you. And so make sure you listen to your teachers and pay attention in class and do your homework and make sure that you get some really good grades because that's very, very important. All right, that's it for now, and I'll see you guys next time.